an establishment law firm for Bass, Wayne and Moore, where he has served for decades as litigation partner. Schwartz's remarkable career has been punctuated by a series of vital public service assignments, the most memorable of which was chief counsel to the church committee. The committee, as many of you, perhaps not all of you, know, was formed in 1975 in the wake of the Watergate scandal to investigate the legal intelligence gathered by the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA. And as counsel, Fritz engaged in the most prominent investigation of the intelligence community that our nation has ever seen. Some highlights of our government's illegal activities that this bipartisan committee unearthed, the CIA had hired the mafia to help in his attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro. The FBI had wiretapped members of Congress. The FBI had tried to pressure Martin Luther King Jr. into committing suicide. Moreover, the committee revealed the existence of COINTELPRA, the widespread domestic surveillance of US citizens. An analog version of the revelations brought forth by this afternoon's Nobel Prize winner, Edward Snowden. Here is a video clip of Fritz Schwartz describing how the FBI tried to undermine the work and smear the reputation of Martin Luther King Jr. The role leader. Uh, after the March on Washington, there was an acceleration. He was defined because of his speech in that demonstration in Washington as the most dangerous and effective leader in the country, and there was a paper battle between within the bureau as to how best to attack him, and he was attacked. Uh, after Time Magazine named him as Man of the Year, again, the bureau finds that reprehensible, believes it must attack and destroy. Uh, when he was given the Nobel Prize, again, they seek to discredit Dr. King with the persons who welcomed him back from that award. Uh, when he began to speak out against the Vietnam War, there's a new crescendo of efforts by the Bureau to discredit and destroy Dr. King. When the War People's Campaign took place, once again, they go after Dr. King. And their activity to go after Dr. King didn't even cease when he died. ones we've seen brutally eroded over these last years. Chris Schwartz went on to serve as New York City's chief lawyer under Mayor Koch, and as he left that office, the New York Times, in a rare goodbye editorial, noted that Mr. Schwartz met the challenges of his office from potholes to human rights, and in New York, he has raised aspirations and performance in city government and made City Hall cleaner and livelier. And his civic activism in his beloved city continued as chair of the Beer Institute of Justice and championed new policies to end the use of deadly force by the NYPD. He headed the much lauded New York City Campaign Finance Board. And if I were to tell you about the articles and books Fritz Schwartz has written on the scores of boards, public interest and educational groups, criminal justice, philanthropic and government commissions that he has participated in over these last decades, decades, we'd be here, well, till the day that the intelligence community Chief Counsel of the Brennan Center, involved with all facets of that good organization's work, especially its commitment to ending the metastasizing money polluting our political system. And he is characterized by his colleagues at Brennan as our MVP and the person who best exemplifies how the highest ideals of the legal profession can be brought to bear on public service. So now when we are again faced with our government's fierce and technological powers to monitor our lives at home, undertake a legal covert action abroad, we need voices like Chris Schwartz's. He is, as Randy Fertel said, a transparency warrior. His call for a full, wide, and no holds barred investigation of the abuses of the NSA and other intelligence agencies would have come about, but I'm happy to say that I called Chris Schwartz a few months ago, and though he was lying in his bed with frozen pea packets on his knees because of knee surgery, he agreed to write a piece as to why, in light of the recent revelations of abuses, ones we've known about for years, but recent, we need a revival of the church committee, a new church committee for these times. So let me end by saying Fritz is that quiet patriot, that quintessential straight arrow who spreads the word that our fragile democracy will be lost if the nation's commitment to the rule of law is allowed to weaken. He understands how vital oversight is to a functioning democracy, and he also believes 
that a legitimate need for secrecy must not be used as a cloak to hide official crimes and our government's violation of our constitutional rights. Legislation, he has said, seldom comes unless the public is convinced of the need for change. And he said change needs teachers, and what needs to be taught is that good policy is more likely and delved through transparency. So in one of those wonderful twists of history, Rich Schwartz, who told me he turned down two offers to become a professor at Harvard Law School, has turned out to be one of our great teachers, and he is still teaching us and guiding us. And for that, it is a great honor to have him here to honor him today. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the 
some comparisons and some differences between the Cold War world that the Church Committee reviewed and the post 9-11 world that we face today. Now, they're both the same and very different. The basics are identical. Fear is the underlying motive for government going too far. And secrecy is the key implementing, implementing device for the government accomplishing what it does. But while the basics are the same, the circumstances are very, very different. Well, one enormous difference is the technology available to the government. Early in our investigation, Frank Church had a press conference to talk about the NSA, in which he warned that its capabilities were so great that if turned on the American people, there would be no place to hide. And then he said, we need oversight and we need, we need controls. But we now know today that the technological power that Church found so terrifying is a mere bagatelle compared to what we now there now is. It was the Stone Age of technology compared to today. Now we know from Edward Snowden's revelations the nature and breadth and the amazing nature and the amazing breadth of NSA's power today. And those revelations by Edward Snowden helped mount and keep going a debate in this country that is vital to our future. <laughs> Paradoxically today, however, while the technology is much more powerful and much more scary, and the material collect collected is much more massive. Actually, secrets today, because of technology, have a much shorter shelf life. It's harder to keep things secret today than it was during the era that we looked at at the church committee. The shelf life of secrets is shorter. I tried to develop this point in the book I'm writing called Democracy in the Dark. Uh, which I hope is going to be coming out in about 11 months, I hope is going to be the most detailed discussion of secrecy there's ever been uh, anywhere. Um, and it's being published by the wonderful Diane Wachtel at the New Press. And when the story went, was given about Sherry Pink continuing to write until the last minute, she gave me a big wink. <laughs> Well, the last time I got a big wink like that was from Nino Scalia when I was arguing a case before the Supreme Court, and he then, he, I knew him at law school, and that's why he winked at me, but he then wrote the opinion that slammed us down. <laughs> there are a couple of other reasons why the shelf life of secrets is shorter. One is there's much more oversight infrastructure today than there was before. Now, that oversight infrastructure is clearly imperfect. The committees that the Church Committee got created, the FISA court that the Church Committee got created, have since 9-11 become much less powerful and maybe much less motivated. But nonetheless, the infrastructure that has been established does um, help reduce the shelf life of secrecy. I've been talking about secrets a lot, probably because I'm preoccupied with the subject in that book I'm trying to finish. Uh, but secret government programs continue to challenge our values, American values, and secrecy remains hard to tame. The Church Committee warned that the United States must not adopt the tactics of the enemy. Well, the most recent administration, right after 11, did explicitly adopt the tactics of the enemy. By deciding upon torture, and there's no way of escaping, that's what it was. It was not enhanced interrogation 
as they called in a euphemism, it was torture. And we did adopt the tactics of the enemy. Waterboarding, which they employed viciously, the Bush administration did, waterboarding was used by the Japanese and we prosecuted against American soldiers, and we prosecuted the Japanese as war criminals. Did we forget that when we decided to use waterboarding? Uh, also, all of the all of the techniques that our government used to torture people came from a manual the military had called SEER. It's, I don't know what it stands for, S-E-R-E. -E. And it took techniques the Korean, our Korean opponents in the Korean War had used to torture American soldiers and used the training based on what the Koreans had done to prepare our soldiers for possible um, torture when they were captured by some opponent. Now, again, amazingly, the most recently prior administration directly took their tactics that they used for torture out of the SEER manual, which came from what the North Koreans had done in order to elicit false confessions from American soldiers. Hardly something to be proud of. And, you know, there's more there that we haven't yet discovered. So the Obama administration, in one of its first and admirable acts, abolished torture and released the opinions about torture, which had justified it and said it really wasn't torture. It was just like a doctor doing a bad job in a hospital or something like that. That was by John Yu, who was involved in his legal analysis. Um, but the Obama administration, while abandoning torture and releasing the truth about what we were doing has nonetheless applied the state secrets doctrine to prevent the courts from hearing cases by people who were tortured. And there's something wrong about a doctrine that says, even the name, think of it, state secrets doctrine, it does not sound like a great piece of American jurisprudence. <laughs> So now, much more information is classified than was true, even under the Church Committee. It's much more of it's classified beyond top secret with a code word protection more stringent than top secret. And actually, secrecy begets more secrecy and higher levels of secrecy because government, individual government people have to fight to have their document snowflake noticed, and they figure a way to get it noticed is to increase the level of secrecy or else it will be just cast aside. Now for generations, bipartisan reports have found that there is too much secrecy. All those reports have met the same fate, wise words into the wind. It's far easier and less personally risky, as uh, my colleague Elizabeth Goitin reported recently. It's far easier and less personally risky to classify than declassify. Secrecy is seductive. It has many powerful psychological lures. Again, this has been seen by the difficulty President Obama has had in establishing his goal of more transparency. But a more fundamental flaw was the failure by Bush II and when he established the NSA metadata program, and by Obama when he continued it, to have a open democratic dialogue about whether we should have those programs. That's what we should be fighting for, that before the government does something, which by the way, that, that wasn't kept secret in order to fool Al-Qaeda, that was kept secret in order to fool the American public. That happens much sooner. <laughs> so now to finish, what we need to do is go back to the basics of American democracy. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson said, a just government depends upon the consent of the governed. Well, the governed, the consent of the governed 
not meaningful unless the governed are informed. And Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> in the Declaration, called for the be keeping alive government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, you can't have government by the people unless the people are informed. So, what is America going to do? Is it going to have the courage to face up to the facts, to find out and face up to the facts? Or is it going to let, continue to let things slide on without pushing for more disclosure and facing up to what we've been doing? I personally believe, maybe this is just naive, but I think all Americans have in their heart that we do believe in democracy. And I believe this country has the strength to hear the story and to learn from it that if we do so, 